We know that the earth is at a tipping point. We're actually reminded of this almost daily in the news with stories about wildfires, flooding, other climate extreme events. It can be quite overwhelming, I think, for us to actually contemplate. Now, over five years ago, I worked as a UN climate negotiator for the UK government. And before that, as a youth climate activist, I was um, engaging on a voluntary basis trying to solve the climate crisis. And at that time, we were quite optimistic about meeting the climate goals and the 1.5 goals. I remember handing out stickers at the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen with the slogan, 1.5 to save 1.5 to stay alive. Now let's look at some numbers. The climate goals are actually impossible to reach without bending the curve on food emissions. In fact, even if we stopped all fossil fuel emissions today, we wouldn't be able to reach the 1.5 goal without addressing the food system, as shown in this chart here. And what's worse, Climate change is actually one of nine planetary boundaries, as you can see from this diagram. And these planetary boundaries are the safe operating space for humanity to thrive for future generations on areas such as water and bio biodiversity and chemical flows, pesticides, etc. And a lot of these ecosystems are what we rely on, actually, to live and to survive in the planet, actually such as clean air, clean water, the services of pollination that support the food that we eat. And as you can see, in many cases, we're actually reaching the danger zone for these systems on which we rely for life. Now let's look at another chart here when it comes to the global mammal, mammal biomass on Earth. And this is quite striking because over 60% of the global biomass is actually now made up of livestock and pets. And actually only 4% of the biomass that we have still on Earth is actually wildlife. And that's actually radically transformed over the past decades. We're now living in what scientists call the sixth mass extinction. Another striking figure about this is this is what you would see if you're an alien looking down on Earth. And unfortunately, what we know is in terms of factory farming, in the US, more than 99% of the livestock are living in factory farms. When it comes to land use as well, this diagram is also very striking. Over 70% of the agricultural land that we have is now made up by either livestock or the animal feed to feed those livestock. And that's one of the major drivers making um, agriculture, the leading, leading cause of biodiversity loss. Let's look at some research from FAIR, which is the organization I'm working for. And what is FAIR? So FAIR is an investor network. Uh, it's a non-profit organization set up by the Jeremy Collar Foundation to work with investors to help them to understand the risks associated with the global food system, risks such as biodiversity, climate, water, and antibiotics. And actually, our research has found that over 70% of the largest meat and dairy companies are high risk when it comes to deforestation. And that means they're not setting targets to stop deforestation in their supply chains, and they're not actually tracking deforestation either. And in fact, what's even more striking, around half of these companies actually had no disclosure at all. Let's turn to a more positive note. As Cristiano Figueres, the UN climate chief, said, who is the architect of the Paris Agreement, nothing gets done without optimism. And it's important to stay positive, actually, to have an impact. And I'm going to talk to you today about a technology that I'm personally really excited about and really optimistic in the way that this could transform the food system, climate, and also support nature. Alternative proteins. Now, what is alternative protein? This could really range from anything, ranging from plant-based uh, lentil or bean burgers, etc., right the way across to the right-hand side of this, cultured meat. 
And that's where you can actually grow meat, like the exact same meat cells, um, in a laboratory without slaughtering any animals. And it may sound like science fiction, but you can actually already buy this in Singapore. So this could be the future of the food system. Um, I also just to mention insect protein is another option here that we see. Um, the impacts are a bit more uncertain and it's a bit less popular at the moment. Um, but in terms of cultured meat, plant-based meat and fermentation technologies, these are really booming. And why is this important? Well, actually, a recent EU study found that actually these technologies could save both carbon emissions, land use and water use all by over 80% as well as using no antibiotics. So what is this about? So as Jeremy Collar, the founder of FAIR, pointed out, you don't have to be vegan to be against factory farming. So this isn't about everybody going vegan. This is really just about reducing the meat consumption in line with the science. And the science is very clear on that. On climate change and on nature, we do need to dramatically eat less meat. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the finance and what's going on in the finance world in this space. So actually, the private investment into plant-based alternatives is really booming at the moment. And this is primarily based on the growing demand from consumers. So you can see from this chart that plant-based uh, food space is rapidly growing. And there's a lot of investment going into the space with a smaller amount to the fermented and the cultivated at the moment. But really, this is driven by consumers and by the demand that we see in the market. And then in terms of policy, so some governments, as you can see here, are also investing into these kind of plant-based proteins and alternative foods. Um, I would point out here that many of the world's biggest governments, you can't yet see on this chart. So the US and China, for instance, are hardly investing, but maybe they will in, in future. And finally, I'm just going to end with one last slide and statistic for you on the policy side, which is unfortunately that the investment into these plant-based alternatives is dramatically outweighed by the agricultural subsidies towards unsustainable agriculture, in fact. Um, according to both the UN and the OECD, around, over, around 500 billion in agricultural subsidies per year go towards activities that are harmful for nature and for climate, and are basically driving the system's uh, failures that we see in the planet. So in fact, we're paying for our own demise. This is taxpayers' money, uh, public finance, that's actually going towards the harmful side of things, rather than more sustainable, um, say, plant-based fruit, fruits and vegetables or organic production, which hardly receives any subsidies. So finally, I'd like to turn back to a more positive note which is that this is changing. And in fact, a lot of the change that we see in this global food system is actually up to us as well. Because as we can see from the trends, the consumer trends for more sustainable products are actually really accelerating. So actually, in terms of what we need to see, we not only need to see system change to actually save the earth and protect the ecosystems that we rely on, but we also need to see individual change as well. And both of those together, which is what's already happening, in fact, leads me to be more optimistic that we can protect the world for future generations to thrive. Thanks a lot.